Hello again, and welcome back to week 19 of year three of the Religious Education Initiative. This is day three. We're continuing our way through the Gospel of Matthew. So last time we saw Jesus leave the house of Matthew to go to help the ruler of the synagogue whose daughter had just died. Along the way, he healed the woman with the flow of blood, and then afterward he also healed two blind men and a mute as well. This time, we will see him go on from there and continue to do the same sort of work throughout the surrounding area. And then we'll see him multiply his efforts. Well, it's not really that. We'll see him send out the disciples and give them a share in this work. So, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So, this is the first time that we see the disciples called apostles in this gospel. And they're called apostles because they have now been sent out. Uh, and this is simply what the word apostle means. It's, you know, an apostle is one who has been sent out. So they are disciples. They're learning from the Lord. They're students. Uh, and then when they are sent out, they are apostles. They are commissioned. They are sent out. They, they have a job to do. And we should begin by noticing uh, what he says to them in verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is kind of funny because he tells them, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And then the very next time, you know, the very next verse, he answers the prayer he commanded to them to pray by sending them out as laborers into his harvest. So uh, this, we can say, is perhaps a, uh, <laughs> a, 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 a warning to us when we uh, undertake to pray for something, for, some, for the solution to some problem that we seek. Because the answer may very, be, may, may very well be that the Lord calls us to be the answer to the problem, calls us to go and minister to the need that we perceive. As a matter of fact, this is almost always the case. If we see someone who's struggling, it's not any good for us to say, Lord, please send someone to help that person. We are the one who noticed. We are the one who has the first call an opportunity to do something about it. Then we see what authority the Lord gives them. And this is remarkable, the authority and power that he gives to them to cast out, to cast out unclean spirits, to cure every disease and sickness, to raise the dead, as we see later on uh, in verse 5 and 6, uh, or rather verse 8, to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. 
uh, to do the things that he has been doing himself. Um, and, and he tells them to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then these signs that they do uh, show the people the reality. This is not just the kingdom of heaven is, is close by. It's coming, but you can't see it yet. It's the kingdom of heaven is close. And then the dead are raised and the sick are cured and the lepers are cleansed and the demons are cast out. And it's very clear the kingdom of heaven has come. The apostles are made heralds of the gospel. They proclaim the power and the glory and the love and the salvation of the Lord. We note, too, that the Lord tells them where not to go. He says, don't go to the Gentiles and don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, this is not because he does not come to save the Gentiles and the Samaritans, uh, but not yet. Right now, especially the apostles, they are not to go other than to their own people, uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, why this is is kind of an interesting question. Um, and I, I, I don't have a clear answer. I would speculate uh, that this may be, in a certain sense, this could be training for the apostles. Let them learn, let them see how to uh, care for people that they are automatically disposed to care for, for their own people, before giving them the, the, the higher responsibility, the more difficult call to love people who have always been their enemies. We see that this is a little bit of a difficult pill to swallow for the apostles, even after the Lord's resurrection. There is discomfort, there is controversy, there is struggle with the idea of, of, of extending the gospel, especially to the Gentiles. The Samaritans, well, they, they seem to be brought in fairly easily, but then the Lord gave the example for that himself uh, with the woman at the well, as we see in the Gospel of John, which we'll talk about next year. Um, we see that they're commanded not to receive payment, and on the same token that they're commanded not to bring any supplies with them. So this is a very narrow uh, path that they're to be on. They're entirely dependent on the hospitality of those in the towns that they go to. They aren't bringing any money. They don't have any resources to call on. They are truly trusting the Lord to care for them uh, and, 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 and to ensure that they don't go hungry, that they don't starve, that, that they're okay. Uh, but they're not allowed to accept payment. Uh, they can be, again, hospitality is a place to sleep, food to eat, uh, maybe clothes to wear if, 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 uh, if it gets cold because they're not allowed to take an extra tunic uh, or sandals. Uh, so they can accept care from the people, but they cannot accept money, they cannot accept payment. Um, and that's, and he says, this is because you have received these things freely. You didn't pay me. I didn't charge you for the blessings, for this calling, for this authority. So you, you can't charge for it. It's the gift of God. Uh, and this is, you know, this is important. Uh, in, in fact, this is one of the, the, the core responsibilities of any Christian clergyman, uh, of any minister of the, of the gospel not to charge for what the Lord calls us to give freely. Um, and the same applies then to all of us. We, we should not charge for the grace of God. So, um, we could, and then we should note too, uh, this final point that anyone who rejects, who refuses, uh, who, who, uh, who does not welcome and listen to, well, welcome the, the apostles and listen to their words, uh, he tells them that it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those who reject the apostles. Because, and we see this expanded elsewhere, if the deeds that are done by the apostles uh, in the name of the Lord had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, he says elsewhere, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Even those people who had not a smattering of, of, of right thinking. Uh, what he's pointing out here is there is an evil uh, in apathy that is almost worse than, than the, the, the great evils of even of violence uh, and, and oppression. Uh, because those who are violent, those who are doing evil in a proactive way, 
they generally are, are conscious that something is wrong. And if signs are done, if they see miracles, they, they have the potential to repent, to, to, to see the horror of what, what, what they've been doing. But when we are apathetic, when we are comfortable, when we are, you know, the, 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 this is, this hardens our heart. It, it dulls our conscience. It destroys our capacity to receive the grace of God. So this is something that we need to be careful with, especially if we see ourselves as, you know, being generally good people. Um, but have we forgotten how to repent? Have we forgotten how to listen to the word of the Lord? Have we forgotten how to follow him? Uh, because this is where things get dangerous. So that is all for this week. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you next week. God bless.